Here we go. Today is Sunday, February 19th, 2017, and this is episode 184 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Callett. Good Sunday evening to you, Mr. Jerry. Likewise. Hope everything's Hope going well. well. Yes. It is. It is. I This weekend was many house chores. It's. It's. I was adulting really hard this weekend. Yeah, I uh, I've been working like every other weekend lately. So yeah, well, I'm I'm glad we had time to get a show in. I know it's been challenging. Yeah, because you know you're so super imp- no. important to your company now that you know just remember us little people. Yes, yes. Speaking of that, uh, just a reminder that the thoughts and opinions we express on the show are ours and do not represent those of our employers. So we can stay busy, or at least I can stay busy on the weekends. <laughs> it's good to, it's good to keep getting a paycheck that's that's right mm-hmm. so uh so anyhow um you know very timely right there was this report from uh from microsoft uh you know, given given the 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 contentious nature of our our active directory discussion last week which did get a lot of feedback it did get a whole bunch of feedback uh mm-hmm. so so um you know, what should I see this week? But this report called Advanced Threat Analytics Attack Simulation Playbook, which, by the way, is is A, a really good read, and B, marketing propaganda for uh, a Microsoft product. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you got to keep that in mind. Right? But, 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 but. I just will say this right up front, and I see this over and over again. We live and breathe this stuff. But your day-to-day Microsoft admins probably would really eat this kind of stuff up because they don't even th- necessarily, unless they have an interest, think about the security side as in-depth as we do. So so things like – because they mentioned here another paper about um, mitigating uh, past the hash, credential theft. And there's like a lot of really good stuff in here that gets your non-security-focused Windows admins to think security. And that's why I like it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I I think, you know, the average, certainly there is nothing new in here for the average pen tester or the, the average person who really follows the, you know, the, the incident response world. Um, however, I think it's super useful, uh-huh. in my view, for the admins and the architects. Yeah. And the reason is that this, you know, <laughs> and I also want to say, by the way, that you know th- this is um, kind of couched as an advanced attack, right? They talk about how these are some of the techniques that were referred to in in uh, you know one of the attacks profiled by the one of the recent Microsoft SIR reports, and, right? <laughs> but they kind of go through enough detail now that um, anybody could do it, right? They're like. There is now mm-hmm. no more. There is no more excuse of of saying, "Oh, you know that that sort of thing is relegated to advanced attackers," because this report is is really detailed and it actually walks you through how to how to use tools like Mimikatz and Powersploit. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great lab setup. You know, in addition to what you're saying earlier about it's great for for your admins and and folks. It's also a wonderful thing for those who really are starting to just get into this world uh, to run through these labs. Uh, yes. It's, yes. It's a really, really solid example of how some of these attacks are done. And, right. And, and definitely worth playing with, I think. Right. So the, so the whole point, and I, I feel like I'm keeping everybody in suspense, right? The, the report here is, is talking about an Active Directory, uh, you're setting up a hypothetical Active Directory environment in, in a lab, and they, they very briefly describe how to set that up. Um, and you, you, they, they actually walk you through a scenario where one of, your, one of the workstations is 
compromise through, you know, they, they kind of abstract it, you know, like it could happen via phishing or, you know, uh, a malicious email attachment or, you know, whatever. Uh, but then they, they walk you through the scenarios of the the attacker using tools like Mimikatz to grab uh, tokens, you know, a, an authentication token on the workstation, assume, again, assuming that, that workstation has a local administrator rights and then using that to um <laughs> to exert what I, I love this phrase domain dominance to to exert domain dominance and and so though you know, obviously this is a, a marketing pitch as i mentioned for this tool called microsoft threat analytics and it, it shows how you know that that tool then detects some of these things but and, and I guess in some cases it actually can block it too. But, you know, the, the the thing I hope everybody walks away with is, holy cow, even with Microsoft Threat Analytics, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're not going to recover, right? So, so oh, are you still on the burn the world to the ground if your AD gets compromised? Absolutely. They don't, by the way, they do not dispute that. And, and by the way, Microsoft, that is Microsoft's advice. When your when your domain gets compromised, yeah, I know it is Microsoft's advice, and 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 you have to pay good money to Microsoft to hear that you have to burn your environment down. I just saved you a whole bunch of money. So anyway, um, great read, very detailed. You know, it's it's. I think this is the perfect thing for, uh, again, for an architect or for a Windows sysadmin who really doesn't understand the potential for abuse of the various tools. One of the things I, I, I would really like to impress upon people is, you know, think after, as you read this, right, think about the possibility of one of these nodes, like instead of this thing being a workstation, it's a web server on your external DMZ, that that has uh you know is running a web application that has some kind of you know either local or remote file include vulnerability or you know SQL injection, and and you know being the vector to completely compromise your domain. Well, I can't let's, let's, see how many times I've seen this. Let's also be clear that you should actually have not your main domain into DMZ. You should have a one-way trust relationship with a with a subforest or whatever the terminology is these days for your internet-facing DMZ hosts. But that's yeah, a whole different conversation. P- point is, that, and I agree, right? You have got to design your environment in a way that accounts for the way these things are being attacked, and it's not right. happening. I mean, in large measure, it's not happening. At least with you know the stuff I've been seeing. So I beg you, please read this, share it. Let's make the world a better place, damn it. Wow. And, you know, so. and maybe Microsoft Threat Analytics can help you. I don't know. That's that's beside the point. That you know, I it's a, it's just a great read. Go read it. So, aside from Jerry's doom and gloom, I think there's a lot of really good stuff in here for making your environment more resilient. So yeah, but but yeah, one of the things they they point out, uh, and and I always forget about this: disable W Digest. Holy cow! Right. Disable W Digest. <laughs> yes, please. And and the reason is so keep you know if you're, if you're not familiar, right? W Digest is is a configuration that will uh, mitigate. Um, Mimikatz from being able to actually pull the plain text password out of LSAS. Right? Is, that, is that is that important? I, not I mean, really. But you know, here's the thing, right? It's kind of like wooden nickels, right? Because yeah, you it you know disabling W Digest, and this is this is the thing that I that I, I again I guess doom, maybe it's doom and gloom. I don't know, right? But so. So if you disable W Digest, which they ham they hammer on a couple of times in the report, right? If you if you have W Digest enabled, Mimi Cats can pull the plain text password. Doesn't matter how complex it is, right? Can pull that plain text password out of memory uh-huh. in the right circumstance, right? I mean, there right. the, the conditions have to be right. Um, if you if you have W Digest disabled, 
right? It requires now. Now all you can get is the ticket, right? right? Which actually doesn't have all that much difference in terms of the the practicalities of what you can do, right? And they talk. They walk you actually through um, using Mimi Cats to create a shell, you know, using that ticket as an authentication mechanism to you know to get around. So it's you know, on the one hand you get a you get a ticket. In the other hand, you get the password. It's like, it's not. So you get, you know, when you get pulled over for the ticket, does does the officer ask you something like, "Do you have any idea how fast you were breaking that hash?" <laughs> this is. Uh, I'm so not even going to. Not even going to. Inter- not that type of ticket. Different not, ticket. Not, not that type of ticket. That's oh, right. see, I need to read the paper. Yeah. So. All right. So moving on. Moving on. Moving yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, next, next. Beat that one to the ground, didn't we? Yeah. Some of us did. Um, next story comes from Security Week, and the title is Google Shares Data on Corporate Email Attacks. So apparently there was some kind of security conference last week. I, no. No. There was a marketing conference. Oh, that's right. That's right. There was a marketing conference last week. It had a whole bunch of people. And a whole bunch of reports came out. One of these reports is uh, from Google on corporate email attacks, and so so uh, you know as we all know, Google is one of the dominant players in the email space, and kind of like nobody runs their own voicemail anymore. It's becoming more and more rare for for organizations to run their own email server, and so Google has um, you know has a lot of accounts and sees a lot of spam and phishing attacks and malware and whatnot. And so they 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 kind of compiled that into a report, which I thought was pretty you know, pretty telling. And they talk about how, for instance, there's a big difference between corporate accounts and personal accounts. And they say that for you know for example, uh, a corporate email account, again hosted by Google, is 4.3 times more likely to get malware than a personal account, and 6.2 times more likely to get a phishing email. But only 0.4 times as likely to get spam. So, in- interesting stuff. Well, I, I think it shows that that the bad guys have truly pivoted towards you know enterprises and corporations. Yes. Yes. You know, and it's interesting too because this kind of plays a little bit into what we were debating last week, or was it two weeks ago? Through anyway, where we were talking about as services, online services are becoming commoditized uh, and and centralized. It's clear that, as you alluded to or said directly, Google is now a very, very, very dominant email provider for enterprises. And is that a fundamentally good thing? They are now becoming better subject matter experts about defending against the current and future threats against email than our own teams. Right. So is it now wise to say, hey, rather than run our own internal email servers, let's utilize Google because they're better for defense. But then the flip side of that is what about all, you know, for highly regulatory environments, what about um, – all of the implications of, I don't know, for instance, disclosure laws or retention laws or PCI compliance or whatever it may be, all the stuff we built up over the years of having things internal, it's almost like we're still catching up when we, when we mm-hmm. push this out to the cloud. But it seems to me that this is certainly the way things are going, and it seems to me that these guys are becoming very good at the security side and it seems worth the risk but yeah. you also yep. you also now centralize the risk if for many 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 organizations if google has an outage or somehow has some sort of mass compromise well and and, and i think kind of by extension right they they become the juiciest target on the block right so now now Everybody's trying to attack Google rather than some people trying to attack you and some people trying to right. attack other companies. But, but does that make them stronger? Because they're seeing all sorts of new interesting attacks. We hope. And, have, and in theory, have the people to learn and defend against it. We hope. I mean, that's, I think that's the, <laughs> that's the idea. Right. right. Um, so so they, you know, they go on and, and they, they talk about, you know, they have some... Um, some interesting discussion about 
uh, Locky, and you know, it, because all, Google also owns Virus Total. They there was a, a really interesting right. graph in here about you know the the prevalence of Locky as seen in Gmail versus the prevalence of Locky as reported into Virus Total, and they don't well overlap. In what uh, respect? Well, see, that's the thing. We uh, from a time perspective. Right, so, yeah. so you saw the you saw the the prevalence of it in Gmail peak much earlier. Well, actually, it, uh, I, I misread the graph. It's actually by the hour, right? So, th- I thought it was uh, multi- sp- spread across multiple days, right? But so you see a peak in the morning of Locky hitting Gmail inboxes, and then later in the day you see a peak of reports t- to uh, the virus total. So, gotcha. it, the, the problem is that the the, the slides. There's a there's a link to the slides in this story, but you don't get the discussion, right? <laughs> so, right. Yeah, so yeah. there's no context. Um, but the but the, some of the other interesting things were that the you know the the prevalence of spam phishing and malware are highly dependent on two domains or two dimensions. One is your geographical location. And so they point out that like Germany is much more likely to get, uh, I think it was fishing. I can't find the page right now. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, on the other dimension, um, industries like entertainment and IT were much more likely to, you know, to be the targets of malware. And and so kind of an, an interesting um, kind of threat uh, way to threat model, right? So, so what are the what are the the things that are attacking you now? I don't know if this is static. It'd be interesting to see how that changes over time. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I I bet that will rotate throughout industries based on what's going on or verticals, right? So, uh, anyway, good good data to look at. I I would love to see the you know the entire presentation be made available, but it, at least. Uh, for the the data that we can see, it's kind of interesting. So moving on to our next story. For those of you who work in the financial services sector, you're going to love this one. Oh, so much fun. So much fun. The, 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 uh, this story here comes from databreachtoday.com, and the title is Reworked New York Cybersecurity Regulation Takes Effect in March. And uh, and so, so this... Um, this one kind of went in fits and starts, right? There was a, you know, a, a proposal sent out for comment sometime last year, and it was really contentious. It it um, it was. I don't recall the all the the specific details of what was really controversial in it, but I know there were a lot of people who were very unhappy with the contents of that regulation, and they backed off quite a quite a few of the the more draconian parts, but there's still quite a lot in here. And and so again, this is, um, this is from the New York department of financial services and it applies to financial services companies who operate in New York and which are probably a lot of them. Uh, and it covers things like, um, the re- requiring the organization to have a CISO and it also uh, codifies something that's becoming kind of an industry industry standard, or I should say, a regulatory standard, which is a seventy two hour breach notification to the supervisor, which is crazy to the superintendent or superintendent, right? Yeah, I, I definitely have some things to say about that. Um, and and then also uh, requiring the use of multi factor authentication, and you know, so that's those were the items mentioned in the report. But if you actually read the regulation, there's there's quite a lot more in here. Like you have to have uh, in competent employees. There's a requirement in the regulation that your employees need to be continuously trained, or you have to outsource that function to someone who is competent. Um, you have to have either a continuous monitoring program in place or a uh, penetration test process, you know, an annual penetration test process and a semi-annual vulnerability assessment process in place. And, and both of those have to be, the, the continuous monitoring and the testing, have to be defined by a risk assessment, which is also 
a requirement now. Um, let's see what other. But it's interesting stuff. because a lot of those things are so subjective. Yes. You know, you know, so you did a risk assessment, but you completely were an idiot while doing your risk assessment. That's okay. We did a risk assessment. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, so th- th- that's not terribly unique. And, and I, I no, see this. I, I, I know it's, it's, it is sort of, it's feeding upon itself now because it's becoming canon. It's becoming, right. you know, precedent. It's becoming case law. But, you know, those of us in the industry are going, okay, so an annual pen test. What happens the other 364 days of the year? Right. You know, or a biannual vulnerability assessment. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. But, but see, here's the thing, right? That those, the, those are intended to be the, the, the scope and requirement of those are supposed to be fed by the output of a risk assessment, which again is a, a requirement here. And, you know, my observation is that there are other regulations. HIPAA comes to mind, right? HIPAA, HIPAA is a pretty prescriptive regulation that, you know, covers a bunch of stuff. And then it says also you have to do a, a risk assessment. And my interpretation of that, by the way, is that, you know, if if you do get a breach, right, and you complied with all the other stuff, then they can the regulator can go, come back to you and hit you on the back of the head, and say, "Well, you clearly did an if ineffective job with your risk assessment." Right. Because if you did a competent job of your risk assessment, you would have you would have identified the circumstances that would would have led to this breach, and therefore you would have. Uh, you know, okay, but they, but they're also not giving any guidance on what risk is acceptable once you do the risk assessment. So if I say, yes, I did a risk assessment and I defined and decided this risk was acceptable to my business, that, you know. Well, I, you know, so so this is the, I mean, this is the... This is the, the the risky part about being a business, right? No, I, mean, I get you, it. You know, <laughs> it, just, it, it, it. You know, to go back on my original comment on this particular article about the 72-hour notification, any incident response I've been involved with, 72 hours in, we're still getting our lay of the land. Yeah. Scope situation of, you know, what is going on. So having to report up to the you know financial superintendent of New York after 72 hours, that is absolutely ripe for misunderstandings, bad information, and and all sorts of crap that that is just going to bite people in the ass. I think I think what's going to it's it's certainly in my view, and this is by the way the same requirement that the new European General Data Protection Regulation has. It's yeah. a 72 hour. It's 72 hours upon. Um, upon discovery, right? It's not and that then you, I would, I'd be very curious, okay, what then is the financial superintendent going to do with that notification? I don't know. But, <laughs> right? but, but I, think that, I think it's going to drive bad behavior in, in two possible areas. Number one is it's, gonna, it's either going to um, change, it's, it's going to create some weasel words within in organizations to define, you know, what constitutes detection of a breach. And, and on the other hand, kind of like we saw with, um, what was it? Talk talk, I think in, in the UK, right. Where they, you know, they disclosed, they had this mega breach and then they came back later and said, Oh, actually we were wrong. It was much smaller. And then they came back right. again and said, Oh no, we were wrong. It was even smaller. Right. Yeah. And that, that, yeah, I, I fear that sort of situation. And, and inevitably, all it's going to do is, you know, legal teams are going to have to figure this stuff out. And right, yeah, it's it, going to it's going to get silly. So, so I, the the only you either either you're going to have to accept, you know, if if you accept that you have to comply to the letter of the law, you're either going to have to run the risk of kind of over-reporting, or you're going to have to really do a much better job of instrumenting things so that you know, you know, with much better fidelity, if there is a breach, what was breached, you know, in in a much shorter time frame. Uh, But to what end? That's where I I go back to, okay, eventually, I'm sure it's going to be to inform customers or to inform shareholders or to inform somebody. But if you're informing with bad information... Yes, that's not doing anybody any good. Well, I 
I see. I, I I suspect I have a slightly different take on the on the purpose of that. I mean, it, certainly, it absolutely is intended to help drive notification of affected parties, right? But I think it, this is similar in concept, in my view, to audit programs, where you know, and, and hear me out for a second, right? In in a normal do 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 I have a choice but yes, to hear you out? Sure, you can I mean, hang can... up. <laughs> Um, but you know, in, 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 typically in a in an audit type environment, you usually have let's say twenty four hours to respond to a request, and the reason is that if you can't respond within that time frame, like you're just out of control, right? And so the the point of it is the point of the seventy two hours, in my view, is to drive organizations to have a level of maturity in their processes. You know, it's it's an artificial uh, stick to to drive maturity into incident response and and monitoring and things like that. So, yeah, I just uh, don't have to like it, but you know, no, it is. I don't. And it, you know, it's one of those things too. I and this could be stretching a bit, but if I'm in an organization that has a choice about whether or not I'm going to headquarter in New York, is this the kind of thing that makes you go, mm, maybe I'll pick someplace else. Well, that's, that's a really interesting point. Yes. But I, I don't know. I mean, that's probably so low on the list of considerations that, you know, it has a lot more to do with tax code and, you know, tax credits and all that kind of jazz more than weird, obscure regulations that only weird people like us care about. Well, I, th- I think you also have the, uh, it's, depending on the the nature of your your organization, you know they're like the, the I know the high frequency traders want to be in New York just because of the speed of light, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, the, I, I guess you you want to be where the the action is, I suppose. So, yeah, that's probably going to. Well, we'll, we'll see how it plays there. out. It's interesting to watch. I, if more states start doing this kind of stuff, it's good. it's going to get messy. Yeah. I agree. All right. So moving on. And, and by the way, that that regulation I think takes effect in March, and there's a there's a sunrise f- um, time frame for for various um, requirements in the regulation. I think span about two years, mm-hmm. if, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, hold on to your hats there. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, Moving on to our next story, and this is really kind of a two for one deal. The, both are, both stories come from ComputerWorld dot com, and the, <clears throat> the title of one is "Polish Banks on Alert After Mystery Malware Found on Computers," and the other one is "Recent Malware Attacks on Polish Banks Tied to Wider Hacking Campaign." These also were published a week apart, by the way. Yes, yes. So the the first one I think was was. Uh, the uh, Polish banks on alert after mystery malware found on computers mm-hmm. uh, was was the f- the first one and and the reason I included that one is because it it has a, has a little bit of detail about what the malware did. Apparently, some malware was detected on the uh, the computers of a Polish bank that uh, uh, did something that we don't, you know, at least the people who wrote the report don't fully understand it exfiltrated some encrypted data and there's really not a clear indication of what that data was which by the way is kind of an interesting problem in the context of the story we just talked about (laughs) right indeed yes so like if you're a regulated institution in new york and you just saw a big file walk out the door what do you report (laughs) well yeah it's (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is the troubling nature of a 72 hour turnaround. Yeah. yeah you know, you because what you're going to be reporting is something happened. Right. Yeah, We're not we, sure what yet. We don't know. Yeah. It's we bad. never know. So, so um, this, the second story talks more about how this happened. And apparently uh, th- this is a part of a, uh, uh, allegedly part of a broader campaign by a hacking group known, known as Lazarus. I think that's how you say it, and the Lazarus Group. And um, what I found particularly interesting was that uh, the alleged method of distribution of the malware was watering hole attacks using 
uh, the websites of bank regulators. Right. Which, yeah, which is pretty intense. Which is fa- fascinating, right? So, yeah. so apparently the, the, um, the, there were an, a number of different, and so what, I guess how this all kind of got linked together was uh, the, the malware was on, on the, these Polish bank computers was identified as coming from this Polish bank regulator, an analysis of the exploit kit that was on the hacked uh, regulator's website matched uh, the the same exploit kit that was on a Mexican financial regulator's website and on a Uruguayan bank. I think it was a state-owned bank. Clearly, this must be nation-state. Totally. Has to be. Has to be. No other explanation. I'm blaming North Korea. Well, that's good because they are too. <laughs> uh, but but the um, the exploit kit apparently exploited vulnerabilities in Silverlight and Flash Player. I mean, both critical business applications that we all need to have on our on our computers. <laughs> Absolutely. How else will I watch the really advanced dancing cat videos? <laughs> I don't don't have any idea, um, but you know the uh, the the exploit kit apparently filtered uh, by IP address, so it, mm. you uh, you you didn't get the payload unless you were part of the the specific victim demographic. So um, I think that's becoming actually pretty standard fare to avoid uh, malware analysis, you know, the researcher analysis. So uh, interesting stuff, you know. I, again, I think this is becoming the the reason I wanted to take this this story is not because it's you know like you're going to get hit by you're likely to get hit by this particular thing, uh, but more that it's the tactic is becoming more com- you know becoming more common, and the, the the watering hole tactic. Yes. Yeah. And I I have it, it echoes in my head right. People, well, people will say in many when, hollow spaces. when you're when it's hollow. I know, I get yeah. it. Ha, ha, ha. It's really funny. <laughs> Tell me another joke, Daddy. <laughs> um. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So, so. Any, <laughs> anyway, um, I, boy, where was I going with that? Oh, um, exactly. yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah um, websites, right? I hear, I hear quite a lot. Oh, you know. Websites that don't have any data, it's like it's just like a it's like defacing a billboard. Or, you know, it's right. defacing a sign. Well, you know what? That's not always true. Nope. Right? And so yeah. And if you want to make it real easy, run WordPress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, by the way, that was um and we, we didn't we didn't talk about that story, but that was no, it's getting ugly. Brutal. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> And and you know, it, and it wasn't even a WordPress plugin this time. It was it was stock WordPress. It was it was stock WordPress that yeah. had been patched. Yeah, that people didn't apply the patch for, and and so that it kills me, right? And and I'm a you know I'm a pretty big proponent and defender of WordPress. I I kind of like WordPress, and I've never actually had a, a problem with WordPress if you keep it patched. Yet, yet I suppose yet is true. Well, this this goes back to something we were talking about. The more, the more we democratize access to sharing information on the internet, the easier we make it for the average person to run these services. Absolutely, the, which is, is in, in itself a good thing. But we are now expecting these people to also have system administration capabilities and 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 skills which they don't have and so we're making it really easy to to start these services and run these things and post things but we're not there's more to it right there's there's nothing on the back end that is training these folks about how to run this stuff securely so we're making it very easy for folks to get online Uh, it's the same thing with internet of things we're making it incredibly easy for any manufacturer to throw anything they want up with an ip address onto the network right and that's good in that it's enabling new and interesting industries and creating re- value and revenue and and new opportunities for doing unique, interesting things. But there's a long tail that comes with that. Right. 
And, you know, we're going to keep seeing this. I think the next big, big problem is going to be the rise of extensive shadow IT on all these cloud providers. Yeah, I think we're already seeing that. Bob and marketing wants to get a website up and the damn security people are putting too many roadblocks in his ways. Hell, I'll just spin up some at AWS. There we go. We're good to go. Oh, we got hacked. (laughs) WordPress. Yep. I mean, I I really think that is the next set of problems we're going to hit, right. like extensively, um, and I don't know how we're going to solve that yet. Well, I, I mean, at, at, at that marketing at that marketing show last week, I mean, I, I'm quite sure there were at least some s- solutions to that problem. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 I know there is. I mean, I, I joke, right? But I know there are. There are some some solutions that will help you try to keep an inventory of your your cloud stuff. Well, sure, unless but, somebody's gone rogue. Yeah. Right, yeah. and are setting it up outside the purview of IT. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's. Yep. That's the challenge. Yeah. Anyway, I, we we digress. But. And and by the way, this this Lazarus group apparently, allegedly was um, was. The same group who uh, may have been involved in the the, the Swift the, the theft of the eighty one million dollars from the Swift network, right? So, which I we clearly have not heard the end of that story. I think there's still stuff going on over there. No, but you know it. it so so here's the thing. Let, I mean, I, and I, I know I'm I'm digressing or degrading into sheer speculation here, right? But mm-hmm. so the. If if this you know if if the the attribution is to be believed and and that it was Lazarus Group that did this and that did the Swift thing and they used the same tactics, that kind of tells me that someone was browsing the internet <laughs> from those those Swift terminals. I just well, want to well, point well, out. Well, why wouldn't you? I just want to point out what a horrible idea that is. You know, they spent a lot of money on those computers, and they need to get their use out of them to fully <laughs> capitalize I, and appreciate them. Obviously, you're right. You're you're right. I'm thinking about it wrong. You know, if it wasn't made to browse the internet, they shouldn't have given an IPv4 stack. That's true, and a web, and the ability to run a web browser. Yep. Right. I mean, IE should not have been on that server. It's Microsoft's fault. Microsoft calls Swift. Well, at least we know who, who to blame now. <laughs> Man, I'm going to get an angry letter from Microsoft. <laughs> yep. All right. So uh, moving on to our last story, which comes from Forbes, and I'm really sorry about linking to a Forbes oh article. Oh, my God, did they badger me into turning off my ad blocker to see it too. I'm so sorry. And then they're like, they're like, thank you for turning off your ad blocker. Here's 30 days of ad light content. I'm like, well, that's kind of nice of you. They, they should offer like a, you know, a, a service to clean your PC or something like that because you need it. <laughs> so, anyway. Sorry. I just, I, Forbes and I are not getting along in this whole ad blocker situation. I'm sorry. Until you can assure me that your ads do not have malware it's on you, buddy. It's I, on you. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel actually kind of bad, but I couldn't you find should. another. I couldn't find a good source. You should feel bad. I couldn't find an alternate source for this. You know, All right, alternate facts. But, well, cover it well, so people don't have to go to Forbes. <laughs> so the title is: DNC hackers are using Apple Mac spyware code from FBI surveillance vendor claims ex NSA researcher. So clearly, nation state. Totally, nation state. Um, story here is that uh, uh, APT28, a.k.a. Fozzie Bear, right? Fancy Bear. Fo- Fozzie Bear. Yes, Fozzie. Fancy. Fo- fancy. Fozzie Bear. <laughs> <laughs> waka waka. Waka waka. That's right. <laughs> is that um, the sound it makes when, you, when, you, you know, when they're hacking? I think I, I can only assume so. <laughs> so um, oh, man, we have completely lost lost control of this podcast. Yep, as if we had it in the first place. So so anyway, uh, APT28 is the um, the group that was alleged to have committed the uh, hacks of the 
Democratic National Com- uh, Com- Committee, right? Which, by the way, later in the article was apparently um, alleged to have been the most significant hack in all history. If you really, if, yeah, 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 most significant in all, all, all of history. Yeah, Every, all of it. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read it. Could we maybe right. at least say all recorded history? Even hacking team had previously warned that terrorists would use its leaked tools in condemning the 2015 breach. It may not have anticipated the hacker group linked to the most significant breach in history would borrow its code for their own machinations. So anyway, um, the story here, which you probably already have gathered a little bit, is that uh, hacking team, which was breached back in 2015, we talked about that at the time, you know, their, their set of tools were dumped online. Um, the 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 code that was found in the response to the DNC hack apparently contains some of the same code that was made by hacking team. So now what is unknown is you know what that actually means in terms of uh, you know attribution because we know that hacking team sold stuff to the FBI and other U.S. governments. We know that hacking team sold stuff to various Russian intelligence agencies. And by the way, apparently every other freaking government on God's green earth, they sold their stuff to as well. And not only that, the source code was leaked online. So, you know, clearly direct line of sight attribution to Russia. I mean, like, they would... Uh, okay. How could it not be? How could it not be? That's right. Exactly. I mean. It's airtight. Airtight. Well, it, it's also interesting that they talk about how snippets of code were removed, but other snippets weren't. And yeah, yeah it's. It sounds like the, 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 the group that copied the code didn't quite understand how it all worked. And so they. Hey, let, hey, it worked in QA, man. Ship it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We are so, an agile hacking team. We got stuff to do. So apparently, the 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 reason they uh, um, this the, this ex NSA hacker who now works for um, you know a a, a cybersecurity company um, believes that the two are related is apparently it had some of the same buggy behavior, right? That you know. Why? Why would it? Why would it not? Right. So, so the the allegation is, and I, it's not clear to me if they actually have the, you know, the the actual code or just the, you know, the some of the behavior that resulted from the running of the code. But anyway, the the allegation is that the that some of the same oddities that existed in the hacking team code also existed in the. Um, you know, the, the, the code that was used in the DNC breach. So, right. But, you know, by the way, there's no reason to think that this wouldn't happen. Right. And we talked about this at the time that, you know, right. when, when you create professional tools, people use them. And then it gets disclosed out on the wide open internet, people are going to use it. Right. Why <laughs> and, reinvent the wheel? Right. Like, we're all lazy. Just, Find something that works and use it. And, and, this, and by the way, is, we, we, this is another problem with attribution, right? Right. I mean, it's digital data that can be copied and reused. I, and the bad guys aren't going to sign it with a reliable signing signature source. Yeah, and and uh, and they're not going to change their language or or time right. zone or anything like that. Um, but yeah, and I mean, they, we, we it could be misdirection. We commend programmers for reuse. Right. So why win the bad guys? Not to mention there's plenty of online forums where people sell code snippets to each other for this particular use. I mean, there's plenty of underground sites that are like, hey, I, you know, wrote an exploit kit to do XYZ. Here you go. And this, you know, it's stuff that was dumped from from hacking team. So of course a bunch of folks are gonna grab it and look at it and use it. Right. So I mean, when when you know, I predict why, why is this so difficult for the for the <laughs> for the infosec media to to get their head around? I don't know. I, I predict in in a year or two, somebody's going to find 
the Stack Overflow, you know, post from you know from some hacker saying I need I need the malware that runs on Mac, and and somebody <laughs> there's going to be a response, you know, with with a you know a, a code snippet from from the hacking team dump. Right. <laughs> Yep. Well, you know, it's 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 the official best way to handle that problem. Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, if we gave Yelp reviews for for code for that particular problem, look, I need I need a handyman, a plumber, and a Mac exploit toolkit. So yeah, yeah, but but see, the thing is, you can't argue with the result, right? I mean, it worked. Mm-hmm. Apparently, <laughs> mostly, mostly, <laughs> well, well enough. Yeah, a few bugs. I mean, got the job done. Yeah. What more do you need? Anyway, anyway I mean, we're, I, we're making light of it, but this this is why it just these these definitive attribution conversations drive me crazy because of stuff like this. Airtight. Airtight. Anyway, speaking of airtight, it's uh, it's time to go. <laughs> that was a really weird segue, but okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's all we have for this week. That's right. Thank you for listening, everyone. And um, again, thank you to all of our Patreon donors. Yeah, somebody and, just tweeted today that they just signed up. That's I, It blows my mind. You guys mm-hmm. are amazing. Absolutely. We should, we should really thank the Patreon donors up front because I doubt anybody actually listens this long into the show. That's probably true. Well, maybe somebody does. Uh, if they can't figure out how to turn off their podcaster. <laughs> well... You know what about those people in um, you know in Guantanamo? That's they, true. They, they don't have a choice. But they're probably not our Patreon donors. True. True. Anyway, they, Patreon donors, thank you. Yes, Seriously. thank you very much. Uh, you can find links to all the stories we talked about tonight on our website at www.defensivesecurity.org. You can follow the show on Twitter at defensivesec. You can follow Mister Callet on Twitter at Lurg, and me on Twitter at maliciouslink. And with that, we will talk again next week. By the way, I just want to point out, two consecutive weeks in a row. It's a trend. It's a trend. (laughs) See you later. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening.